Hey, hey, everybody, welcome on into Live at Five. I am Jessica Putnam Phillips, and we are here in the Clay Share Studio. That's right. And tonight we are going to make two sided texture plates. That's right. So, this is fun. This is a little um, take on plates I usually teach you how to make, but we're going to do texture on both sides. So, I have some right here to show you that haven't, they haven't been glazed. I just did these the other day, but we look, we'll see we have texture on the back texture and texture on the front. So we have texture on both sides. And then I also made one with just texture on the back, my traditional way of making a plate to show you all. So I'm gonna show you how to get texture on both sides of your plates. And we're gonna be making these from slabs of clay. So it's a pretty simple technique. And we're also going to be talking about the new Mako glazes. I have samples that I fired this last weekend. So last Wednesday we did a glazing with the new Mako glazes and we had a bunch of test tiles and they're out of the kiln and back and we're going to talk about those briefly. And we're going to give away right here. I can't pick all five of them up because uh, I just, I don't have enough hands. But we're going to be giving away the five new Mako stoneware glazes another sample pack tonight and we'll be doing one next Wednesday and the Wednesday after for a total of four because we already gave one away. So we'll do that at the end of the broadcast after we make these plates and then directly after this in my private broadcast for premium members of Clayshare, you all know who you are, we are going to be making wallflowers. So we're going to be taking some of the things we do in this class and going a little further and turning them into sculptural wall pieces. So that's going to be super fun. So we're doing that next. Hi, everybody tuning in from all over the place. We've got people from Oklahoma, Australia, from Estonia, from Georgia. Hi, 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 hi. We are live on Instagram, Facebook, Clayshare.com, Vimeo.com, my YouTube page, the Clayshare app, Amazon TV, Apple TV, and Roku. So basically, everywhere you can watch TV, we're live right now, and you can watch this tutorial and hang out with us. So let's get right to the new Mako glazes. Now, in my Good Morning Clay Share broadcast every Monday morning, my premium members, you all saw these, right? You got the sneak peek. And I did put a little video up today showing that kiln opening so you all could see these there. But I'm just going to run through the glazes rather quickly. Mako has a lot of information out on these new glazes. There are five. The cenote is the only one that Mako recommends as dinnerware appropriate. The other four are not dinnerware appropriate. It does not mean they're not food safe. They are. They're just not the best choice of glazes for dinnerware. So I see everybody chiming where you're from. Hi, and Susan's here from Spain. Alice wants to know how to order. Um, if you want to order Mako products, well, guess what? We're teaming up this month for the month of May with Clayscapes Pottery. So go to clayscapespottery.com and you can save 20% off of all of Mako's stoneware glazes and Mako washes, which we'll be using next week. See, we're going in, a, in a, we, have, we have a plan here. Next week, we'll be using the washes on textured plates. Go figure. And we're making textured plates tonight. It's like it was planned. <laughs> so if you go to Clayscapes Pottery, they already already are automatically, I like to say automatically, although that's a mouthful, right? They're applying that 20% off, so you don't have to do anything at all. You just go buy your Mako glazes, they're 20% off. All right, so this right here is the cenote. I think we'll go to camera two to give people a really nice, nice view. So cenote, which is a really great stoneware, glaze. I love it. it. has these lovely little bursts in it. Let me get this so you guys. Look at those little bursts. Try to get that glare off there. So it has these little flecks of like brown and olive with that beautiful robin's egg blue. Super nice glossy glaze. Just looks spectacular on everything that I put it on. So I'm really happy with that. This one right here is their sea salt. It's a satiny matte. And it's, it's good. Um, my second favorite, I think. So this is for the folks on Instagram. And then the green one they do is the Rainforest. So that is also a satiny matte. Fairly good for texture. Not, not necessarily my first choice. 
more sculptural than dinnerware, but, but it's still a nice color. And then the azurite, which is the deep, dark, more cobalt sapphire blue, which is the sibling to the rainforest. So pull that up so y'all can see the rainforest. And then this one is called Landslide, which is an iron rich glaze. It's this really nice brown. It shows the texture pretty well. Um, out of the, the four, I would say, that I just showed you, this one here is the best. The Landslide is probably the best for texture. I think so. Now I decided to have a little fun and see what would happen if I put a couple other glazes on it. I haven't played with these enough to really have a lot of, of test samples to show you all, but I'll get some and I'll share them. So this is Himalayan salt, inside, outside, and then muddy waters on the top. Look at that, inside, outside, and on top. And then this one here uh, on this piece is indigo rain, inside, outside, two coats, cenote, two coats, outside, and on the inside rim right here, and then light flux. So you can check that out right there. Look at that. So, and this one got some nice melt, really nice melt happening on these, I think. So these are really great glazes and um, I'm happy with them. You know, I, I really like glazes that are much more food appropriate than these, but the cenote kind of is my favorite. The other four are good. Um, the Himalayan salt has a lot of possibilities. I can't wait to explore with that. All right, let's talk about the plates. I saw some questions about the rim templates. So the ones I'm showing you tonight are all my own designs of plates that I've done. So these are uh, ones I used to make for me in the studio, which I've partnered with Sharon Hoppy Designs. Her website is SharonHoppyDesigns.com and you can buy my rim templates. She also has her own line of them. So you can check those all out. We're gonna be using mine tonight because it's my show and that's how we roll. But I have, I believe, a three or four, four to show you tonight. So this one here is my Avalon and it's more of a classic traditional template right there. And I did one plate using a hex form and the other I used, um, actually octagon form, or no, that's the hexagons. And I forgot, I thought I had the, I don't, I don't have any of the um, octagons, I only have the hexes. So the hex from GR Pottery Forms and then the circles. Not to confuse myself, right? So that's with my Avalon. Uh, this is my cobblestone glaze, that's the color on this. The texture is my sweater weather rolling pin that we probably won't use tonight, but you can check that out also from Sharon Hoppy. And then uh, this is a Mako Lavender Mist with the dark flux on the rim. So, and we've talked about these before. So that's my Avalon. This is the Holiday Lace Rim Template. Kind of looks like a lace doily sort of on the, the edge. This is my cloud template. Looks like a cloud, right? So we got these things. And then tonight, my brand new one, which just came out, like just came out um, today, I think it's the first day you can actually get it, is my marigold. And that's what we're gonna use tonight. That's what the plates we're gonna make. So here's a stack. Oh, look at these. Looks like a, like a marigold, right? And we're gonna make some plates with these. But you can use any rim templates you want. You know, I have a class on clay share. When I started, I made my own out of cardboard. I just cut them out. I also use cake boards. Like if you go into a baking aisle in any store, you're gonna see these cardboard cake boards. You can just use those as rim templates. That's what I started with. Even paper plates will work as a rim template. So you don't have to buy fancy ones if you don't want to. It's just if you wanna make a set of dishes and you want to have a nice stacking set, it's nice to get these, that way you can have every size plate match, like, like these do, right here. So we'll, we're gonna use the marigold tonight. So how do I keep both the rim and bottom of the plates flat when drying? So Michael, we'll, we'll talk about that when we're making it. We're gonna make some without feet. You can make them with feet. What I do is I leave them on the form until they've set up to their leather hard, usually overnight. And then after I take it off, I put weight bags on and I hold them down. And I also put plastic, so that helps as well. So we'll, we'll get into that when we get into the making part of the 
program tonight. Hey, hey, I'm trying to see where everybody's at. New Zealand's in the house, Ontario, Canada, Simi Valley, Clearwater, Florida, Louisiana. Woohoo! Awesome. I love seeing all the places everyone is from. So let's talk about texture. So, you know, I love texture. You guys probably already know I love texture. I talk about texture a lot. I do have a line of rolling pins that I've designed and, and you can use those, but you don't have to. There is a lot of really great textures just in and around your house or that you can find at home stores like Home Goods, the dollar store, geez, even Walmart, Michaels, arts and craft stores, any place that sells, um, you're going to find it in the holiday section, the featured section, where they have placemats. So here we have one that came out last fall. You know, you can get a two pack of them. If you wait till after the season is over, you can get these on clearance for just like 75 cents to a dollar. So this right here, um, a pair of leaves, and I have to give a huge shout out and thank you to Jody Batson who sent this the ones I'm going to share with you tonight to me last year. So Jody sent these to me. So this leaf one makes a great texture. Now you could use the whole leaf and I've done that in classes. We've used the whole shape and turned this leaf into a piece of pottery, right? But we're just going to use the texture right there. And if you look at that pattern, well that pattern is the same as the pattern on the back, Instagram folks, everybody else. It's the same texture. That's it. And it, it kind of loses the outer shape. You don't see that it's a leaf. All you see is that cool texture that's on the inside. So we're going to go ahead and move to the next one. Um, I'm not going to talk about this one too much. This is like a grippy pad. It gives you a pretty uniform, almost canvas-like texture. It's a good texture. It's not my first choice of texture, but it's a good one. If, if, if that's what you have, use it. Then this placemat, this is a holiday placemat, you know, kind of the silvery, sparkly, the other side's just black. And they give a really great texture that looks like a knit pattern. So this one here I used, and I put that. It's on my flower, and it's drying over there. So we'll talk about that. We'll use that, though, in a second. And then this one, that's pretty awesome. Big old placemat. And what I like about the rectangles here is you can get a nice big sheet of texture and you can basically make any size platter you need. Like this pretty much covers almost every size you're going to make. From <laughs> Jim's from exotic Wisconsin. Ooh. And then the, the other nice thing you can use for texture are lace um, and doilies and things. And this is one I got on eBay. It's a seashell design. Isn't that cute? So we're heading in the summer or you might live at the beach. Maybe you want to do something like this and you don't necessarily have to use the entire thing. You can just use parts of it. Like say you just want to use this seashell here. Well, you just line it up so that one is on your clay when you roll your texture in. And so that's the one that will be featured. So the grippy pad would be good for the back of tiles if they're going on a wall or into a frame. It would. And you know, the grippy pad here, this is what I use to make back grippers. So I have a little tutorial on how to make your own back grippers for when we're doing things on our wheel or if we're just hand building or whenever you're glazing, maybe you need a little something that'll grip things. But not my first choice for adding texture, but very, very handy duty in the studio. Yes, very handy in the studio. One of my, one of my go-to tools. All right, so I rolled some clay out beforehand because I knew we were going to really get into texture, plus we have a giveaway, and I, I don't want to run out of time and not have the giveaway, right? So I rolled out some clay earlier, and I got it right here. And, oh, and we have someone watching from Cairo, Egypt. Hi. Say everywhere. People from all over the world are hanging out. So this is how I store my clay after I roll out a slab. Often I'll roll a slab out at the beginning of a day, and I wrap them all up in plastic, I layer them on each other, and they just sit until I'm ready to use them. That way I don't have to go and roll just a little bit of clay. And my slab roller's over there. That's why I'm looking in that direction fondly because that's where my slab roller is stationed. 
the Libby's Mom crochet gorgeous Portuguese doilies. Oh, and you're making plates for your whole family. Oh, Libby, that is so sweet. What a, what a great way to remember your mom. I love that. Yeah, that's, that's one of my favorite ways to use doilies is when you have something handmade by a family or member or a close friend and you can use it to make things. That just makes it extra special. So I roll my slab out. You can roll it out by hand with a rolling pin, which I show you guys all the time how to do. Or if you have a slab roller, you roll it out on your slab roller. This clay here is Laguna B-Mix 5. It is a mid-range stoneware. It's a nice, yummy cream color. No grog or sand or grit in it at all. It's just a nice, smooth clay. And it's actually the clay I used here. So it's this light color. Let's see if I have a, a bigger piece. You can see it's just this light color. It's just a nice, soft color. And it's really easy to work with. And you can pretty much find it anywhere that sells Laguna brand clays. So we're going to go ahead and do you have them stacked on each other? You can do that. You don't have to have anything in between these. They're not going to stick to each other once you roll them out. And so we're just going to take the top one and I'm going to sit it on a work board. Let me grab a board here. And we'll use that. Now, this is, uh, I think, yeah, Gia Pottery Forms makes these, but you can use any boards you want. I make my own often from plywood like this. You can make them square, you can make them round. It's whatever you have. I'll use anything to make work boards. It's just whatever's available in my studio. Like, if it sits still and I can use it, I will. All right, let's start with, what size we're gonna go with? We're gonna do the big one. Let's do the great, let's do the big one. And so, we're gonna go with this piece here. And I'm gonna go ahead and cut a piece off. Now, I know you're looking at this and you're thinking, but that's not enough clay. It will be when we get done with it. By the time we're done, we'll have enough clay. Do I sand my work boards? So ones I make myself, I do, yes. Um, for my big work boards, I'll put two coats of a water-based satin polyurethane, but you must sand in between coats and sand after the last coat too. And that will help the boards from delaminating, you know, because plywood is just layers of wood. And what happens over time is when they are exposed to a lot of moisture, those layers will delaminate. And by putting that satin water-based polyurethane on there, you're getting a couple more years out of those boards. So it's worth doing. And they sometimes can be a little tacky, a little sticky at first. So what I tell people is sand them and don't use super wet clay on them right away. All right, so we have got our piece of clay, our first piece of clay right here. And we're gonna prep it up. Because I rolled this out on my slab roller and I used canvas, you can see there's a canvas texture in here. It's okay, canvas, there's nothing wrong with canvas texture. It's just, it's everywhere, right? It's, it's on everything. So it's not really unique or special. So I always, I always want something a little more than that. But if all you have is canvas, go with it. There's some really cool stuff you can do with canvas and burlap for texture. How long will they, my slabs stay soft wrapped in plastic? Well, I've had them stay soft for three, four weeks if you wrap them up and you just put a little extra plastic on them. So you saw how well that was wrapped up and then maybe drape it with another piece. But honestly, if air's not really getting in there, they're not really drying out. So they can keep for a very long time. Usually for me, the longest I let them set I mean, I have had them <laughs> sit for three, four weeks and still use them, but usually the most I go is about a week. That's rare because usually I use all my clay up within a couple days, but easily they can sit for a week. All right, so we're smoothing out all of that texture. And then we're going to release this. And now let's see. I want to make sure this is going to fit. And it's not quite big enough yet. 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 So what we're gonna do is, I rolled this out to about 3 16ths of an inch. 
and that's plenty thick for a plate, plenty thick. So we have extra room so that we can stretch the clay and get the size we need. Plus, we want it thick enough to add texture. If your clay is really thin and you try to add texture to it, it'll actually be so thin that the clay could crack or it will warp really easy. So you want, you kind of want it a little thick. So let's see where we're at. Look at that, so close. There. So that's gonna do it. Yep, it's exactly the size we need it, but I know through adding the texture, it's gonna stretch the clay again, so we'll be good. All right, we wanna do texture on both sides, and we're gonna do it at the same time. And I'm gonna show you multiple ways to add texture to both sides. So for this big one, I think we're gonna do a double mat situation. And I think we'll use two different textures. We're gonna use this for the bottom right here. This is kind of like a knit sort of looking pattern. It's actually more organic with like vines on it, but for some reason it comes out looking like a knit pattern. And then we'll use this one, which is like a dahlia, great big dahlia texture. So let's put this right there for now. All right, so this is the back side of our plate. We'll drape that there. So all you want to do is make sure whatever you're using for a template that everything's going to fit and that's going to work. I don't really think one side's better for texture versus the other. You know, one side's more flat, the other has a little bevel to it. I would be more inclined to put the bevel towards the clay because I think that's where you get a little more interest. Instead of just a harsh cutting down line, you have a little bit of a slope. So we'll do that. I'm just going to put that on here. Just press that down. So you tried keeping your clay, it was a mug moist by wrapping it in plastic and it ended up forming mold after about five to six days. Yeah, clay will do that. Um, there are organic materials in clay and it will mold. So that's completely normal. It's not harmful and it, it won't hurt the pot or you. It just, clay molds, it does that. So we're gonna go ahead using a regular old rolling pin and we're just gonna roll it in. So one side, now we're, we are not going to peel this off yet. Flip the whole thing over. I wanna make sure that this is rolled well on the back side too. That looks good, let's check the front. You ready? Front looks good as well. So now I'm gonna peel this off. Look at that texture. We got nice texture on the back. So that'll be the back side of our, of our plate. And then I wanna flip the whole thing over. And let me grab another board right here. We'll just lay this on this. And we're gonna flip the whole thing over. And we'll peel this up. Look at this texture. Look at how great that is. This, this right here is awesome. I love this Dahlia placemat. Love it. Now we're going to go ahead and cut out our shape. On my overhead. How's that? Is that better? So we're just gonna go ahead and place this on here. Now, to cut these out, these rim templates, they're really pretty thick. They're a quarter of an inch thick. So you can take your needle tool and it will ride around nicely, that edge. So it's easy to cut with. You can use a clay knife if you want to, to cut it. Uh, you don't really need to for these though. They work really well with the needle tool. Now some people like to do, well, there's a couple different ways. So. I usually hold my, my template down and then I cut in. Some people flip everything over onto the template, pull the needle tool up and cut that way with the, with the rim template under the bottom. It's up to you. There's not a right or wrong way. It's just what way works best for you and your workflow. 
So where can you get these texture mats? I find them everywhere you can get them at. If you have a dollar store, a home goods, Bed Bath & Beyond, uh, Walmart, any Michael's craft store, I don't know if AC Moore is still in business, Hobby Lobby, lots of stores carry them and they're often, you often see them in the autumn and around the holidays because people will use them under their, under their dinner wear during holiday entertaining, you know, like they'll put their, their um, holiday decor on top of these placemats and stuff. So if you keep an eye out, but you know what, springtime, summertime, there's a lot of great textures out there because people are doing barbecues and picnics and cooking outdoors. And there's a, a lot of really great things that companies make for the entertaining that we can use as textures in our pottery. So there's our beautiful marigold plate. Look at that gorgeous big plate. Now let's go ahead and smooth our edges. It's a little rough when we use that needle tool, so we're going to smooth that out. So that's such a good question. Will cutting along the edges damage this board? It will not. I am not cutting with a really sharp tool. I'm using a needle tool and it's not really cutting into the board. It's just riding along that board. So what I'm doing now is using this plastic and I'm just rubbing the edge here. And so what we have is this really sharp edge there. Let me, let me rub one and leave one unrubbed. And I'll put it up to camera too so you guys can see. So right here at the front, you can see this one is rubbed nice and smooth. See how that one's still sticking up and rough? So this gives a really nice finished edge. And I'll show the folks at Instagram. This one right here is still rough. See how this one's kind of smoothed down. It's just saving yourself a little work down the line. And make sure you get the outside and the inside curve. And we're going to flip it over. We'll do both sides. And what I find is if you ever are getting cracking on your plates, right here at the inner point of a curve, what happens is when we're cutting, and it really happens a lot when we're using a knife, is you cut in and you're making a line and that line wants to continue although you might stop and make another cut in you've created a little weak spot right here so by smoothing it out rubbing it with the plastic while it's flat like this i'm making sure if there was any kind of area that would be prone to cracking has been compressed and smoothed out so i don't have to worry as much about it cracking on me so that's just a little tip for those of you if you're having trouble with cracking which happens to all of us. And it's just a little simple thing of compression, that area, and it takes care of it. You also will get cracking if you let it dry too quickly. The clay can crack. So we'll flip this whole thing over so you can see both sides. The hard part is picking which side you want to be the top of your plate and which part you want to be the bottom of your plate, right? Hi, Richard, how you doing? Everything looks so pristine and professional. Well, thank you. <laughs> if you were here, it would look a little different. No, it, actually this new studio space looks great. It's a really, it's a great space to work in. There's a lot of room. Plus I got a like 200 year old barn with great patina on the wall. All right, so I smoothed both sides out and then we have to make the decision what shape we want the inside of our plate to be. And I was showing you some earlier. I used the hexagon form for this one and a circle form for this one. Actually, let me go with the, I got two that are bigger. Let's do these. Hexagon form, right? So you can make a plate that uses a hex form on the inside, or this one has a circle. It's, an, it's entirely up to you. It's what you want. I'm gonna do circles because I like it. But if you had square forms, that would work. Now, I'm gonna be using GR Pottery forms tonight. You 
can use, if you don't have access to GR Pottery Forms, because I know not everybody does, we have an international following, we have a lot of people all over the world watching, and I know GR Pottery Forms might be difficult to get a hold of where you are. So let me show you, before I knew about GR Pottery Forms, I'm going to show you what I was using. I'll put that little guy. So before I knew about GR Pottery Forms years ago, I would just go to my local hobby or craft store, and they sell these little wooden plaques. And that's these right here. This is an oval one. I used it to do soap dishes. Now GR Pottery Forms has an oval similar to this now, which is great. The difference being, when we look at these, I don't know if you can see the difference on camera, but the GR Pottery Form has a really nice sloped side that gives a, a nice finish. The ones you buy in the hobby store, they're wooden plaques. They're meant to be decorative, so they have this decorative profile. This will leave some more lines in your, in your plate. But they work. I used them for years. And this is, when I bought it, it was $1.47. So I love GR Pottery Forms, but if you can't get them, you can use these wooden plaques here. All right, so let's pick our size out. So what you're going to do is, this one right here, I think these two match up nicely. So you can always put your GR Pottery Form on your rim template and see how they're going to fit. And you want to have about an inch to an inch and a half extra space on each side. That's what I like for a rim. You can do a two inch rim. They get a little floppy, but they do work. And then line this up. We're going to get this as close to centered as you can get it. We're just, we're just eyeballing it. We're not really going to stress over that too much. Then we're going to flip it again. There's a lot of flipping here. So your first order of GR Pottery Forms are on their way to you in Australia, but it cost you $130 in postage. But you know, Carolyn, um, I've had my GR Pottery Forms for years, and they, they do last a long time. So they're worth the investment. And especially if you're making pottery and you're going to be selling it, that's all just business expense. You figure it out, you put it into the cost of making, and you pass that cost along to your customer. That's how businesses work. You look at all your expenses, like, ooh, that's a little high, I might not want to pay that, but you break that down and you pass it along to the customer so that it becomes a business expense and then it's not like, oh my goodness, it was $130 to ship that. So we flip this over and now we're just going to take our hands and we're just going to gently walk our hands around, you know, pressing it in. Normally when you see me make plates, you guys have seen me make a lot of plates, I think, we'll take a rib and we'll smooth it all out and then we'll turn the rib on the side and we'll smooth the sides. Well, we can't do that because if we do that, we lose this awesomeness. So we can't do that tonight. So as I'm working, I'm actually pressing in, not just down, but inward. So that way the clay is being pressed against that form. You second how good the broadcast looks. <laughs> awesome. Yay, I love it when it looks good. I love hearing it looks good, too. Kev, Kev is blushing, he says. <laughs> I can't see him, so I can't tell you if he's really blushing or not, because there's too many lights and monitors in his production booth back there. But he blushes easily, so he's probably blushing. So by pressing in, I'm not smearing. I'm not trying to crush my texture. I'm just kind of, I'm actually... Like this is the plate, this is my hand, I'm actually rolling. I'm actually rolling my hand. I don't know if that's helpful, but I'm actually more rolling the hand than I am kind of smearing. It's, it's not a smearing motion. And the measurements for the templates, um, this one right here, it's the dinnerware set, the four. Let's see, do I have my, let me see if I have a measuring device. Yeah, the set looks professional, but I'm not. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's the same old me. Uh, I, had, I had a ruler. I don't know what I did with it. Um, I want to say this one right here is a 12 inch, but it could be a little bigger. But it'll be like a 12 and then a nine and a half. And then 
an eight, and then a six and a half. Something like that. But they're on SharonHoppyDesigns.com, and it's called the Marigold Template. So that's, the, that's that one. All right, so, oh, look at that. Wow your friends, amaze your neighbors. You just made a plate. This needs to sit on it until it's not soft anymore. In my studio, four or five hours, or overnight, whichever comes first. Depends on how late in the day it is. And so you'll let this sit, and then I'll, I'll do one like, we'll pretend, we'll pretend I just made this one. Hold on. i got to set it up for you. Okay. <laughs> totally pretending for you guys, but it's the same process. So once these have sat up, you're going to want to flip them over, right? So pretend this, this is it later. Um, before you flip it, one quick thing. Texture on the bottom. So how do we sign our work? A lot of times when I sign my pieces, I will find one. I'll carve my name into it. I'll put some black underglaze and carve my name in. Well, I can't do that on this because there's so much texture here. So what I do is I have a stamp somewhere, there it is, that I made that's my initials in my dusty, did you like that? I'm like, oh, don't, no clay dust. And what do I do? Psh, clay dust everywhere. It's not in there. So I have my stamp, oh, there it is. It's, it's in my giraffe bowl. Okay, so this is my initials and I'm just gonna stamp in the center. So there, I signed it with my initials. So that's what I do on highly textured pieces. That's what you get. That's my signature. So. Once it's set up and it's dried, you're going to want to flip it off the form. And like I said, it's usually four hours, five hours. can be overnight. It depends on the humidity where you are. So flip it over. Ah, Sharon's got the sizes. It's seven and a half, nine, ten and a half, and twelve is the four piece. Thanks, Sharon. She knows because she makes them for me and for you. She makes them for everybody. So you flip this off and you get a plate. Look at that. Texture on both sides. And the only thing I do to them at this point, because we already smoothed our edges with that plastic, we don't have to do a lot of cleanup. You're just going to take a damp sponge, fold it up like a little taco, and you just go around your edge and smooth it out. If there's any areas that you didn't compress really well before with the plastic, go ahead and go in with your fingers and compress it really well. But that's it. Now, they need to dry, and you want them to dry nice and even, ideally slowly, and you don't want them to warp because slab-built pieces are always trying to warp on us. What I will do is I will take this plastic. This is just... The plastic you can get from your dry cleaners, the plastic you get when you are um, putting up those winter insulation window kits. You know, you just put them on your windows to keep the cold out. Well, save those. You cover your plate up. Remember, this is a leather hard plate, right? And then make some weight bags. This is just kitty litter in an old shirt sleeve. Look that I tied knots in the end. And this one right here, oh yeah, one of these, see how I can make it flatten out like a pancake? And then I just let it sit like that till it's dry, till it's all the way dry. And what I usually do is the next day I come out, check on it, see how things are going. If they're drying well and I'm not really worried about it drying too fast, I'll take the plastic off and then I'll just put the weight bag back on it. But I like to leave the weight bags on it till it's completely dry. They sometimes try to bow up, especially when you're working on a board, because the board is wicking the moisture out. If there's nothing on top, you've got two different ratios of drying, right? One's drying different, one side's drying different than the other side. So this helps resist that and keeps everything nice and flat. So that's how I dry them and prevent the warping. Painter drop cloths work good too, Judy. Great suggestion. I love that because you pretty much can find painter drop cloths everywhere. Not everybody has access to winter window insulating kits, right? Because not everybody lives here in the great white north. 
I know that's Canada, but Vermont is almost Canada. We are basically Canada. <laughs> Parts of Vermont are more north than Canada. I think all of Vermont is more north of some parts of Canada. Okay, so that's what you do. And what I will sometimes do is, did you notice how clever I was and I snuck another plate on there? So I'll go ahead and stack two plates as long as they nest together because the smaller plate is actually weighing down the bigger plate. And then I use the weight bag to hold down the small plate. And that's it. It's done. And then they'll just sit there and dry. And if you're concerned at this point that they might be drying too fast, Okay, get your plastic out wherever you get your plastic from, cover, and just let it sit on your shelf like that until it's completely dry. Now check on it, and when it's ready to be fired, put it in your kiln and fire it. So you're in Hobby Lobby this week, and they were putting out fall items, and they had the leaf placemats I'm using already. Okay, so Beth was in Hobby Lobby, and if you all are in Hobby Lobby, guess what you can get now? These guys right here. Um, let's do another one and let's use the leaves because we didn't use the leaves yet. We used the dahlia and we used the, um, it's like vines, but it does look like a knit texture. It really does. All right, so I'm going to sit this one off to the side and we'll grab some more boards and we'll make another. And, you know, I made a terrible mess with all my little bits of clay there. But you notice, wet clean always. Clean up that. I'm going to put that back in my water. <laughs> Vermont folks are honorary Canadians. We are. <laughs> we have maple syrup in our blood too, don't we? Okay. So, moving on up. Let's make another one. I have another board. Grab our clay back out. So you can see how, you know, if you had your slab rolled out and you have a set of these, right, you get the set of four or whatever you have, you could easily make four plates like boom, boom, boom. And you made a set of dishes. And then once they dry, take out the pieces you made and then put another one in, right? So you could just make dinnerware all you want. I mean, I did an installation of 96 plates and I think I made it in two months. So in two months I made 96 plates. Like, and they were carved, hand carved each one. Some of you all remember that. Um, I, re I recently actually shared the post because that was two years ago. And those went to Chicago and were on exhibit there as um, in the Chicago Cultural Center. So that was pretty exciting. I got to have a big banner hanging up in downtown Chicago of my work with my installation on it and a bunch of my pieces. So that was awesome. But you can make 96 plates if you want to. I actually ended up making like 120 because some, I didn't know they would all make it through the firing. So I made extras. But the cool thing is, is each one can be consistent as far as size goes. You know, if you know you need a set of eight dinner plates and you want each plate to be the same size, rim templates, they'll get you there. Plastic tablecloths, yeah, those would work for covering your pieces up too, completely. Oh, thanks, Judy. You love seeing the installation in Chicago. It, it was fabulous. It was really great. I was honored to be a part of it. Used rice at first, but the mice came in the house through the socks. <laughs> yes, if you use rice um, in your weight bags, the mice will probably find it. I use kitty litter. Uh, you could use beans. This is actually wood pellets from a pellet stove. You can kind of actually see the pellets. Sometimes these little sharp edges of the pellets will poke into your pieces, so you, you might not want that to be your first choice, but it will work. All right, so we're just going to thin this out a little bit because the clay is very thick. And we're going to use leaves. We're going to use this leaf right here. And because I'm using this template, when we hold it up, you can see that there's enough texture 
that's going to be on this, we're not even going to worry about the leaf part. The leaf part is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. So let's put this down. We could do leaves on both sides or just leaves on one. It's a, it's a up to you situation. Hmm. Do we want to do a lace doily? Yes, we do, Jess. Okay, good. Let's do that. So we'll do a lace doily. Now, the one I just set over there, I used a rolling pin on one side and I did a placemat on the other side. So you can still use rolling pins. You're not limited. You're not, you're not being told, no, you can't use that. It's just um, lots of options. All right, so let's roll the lace doily in. And then we're going to flip the entire thing over. It's already pretty much all the way pressed in, that leaf. Yeah. So I think, geez, I feel like that lace is in well. Because if so, I think we could we'll just give it, we'll just give it another once over. But I think, let's flip it this way. So we get this great. Look at that great texture. So nice. And because I had two, I could have done this on both sides. But I, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to mix it up. So let's go ahead. My other round board is being used. So I'm just going to do this this way. And now we'll peel the lace off. So it's a more subtle texture, but the lace, it does it. I'm going I'm to put you up to camera too. So you can see that. I see folks are East Village in New York are here. Hey. So you get this, I got this starfish on this one. And I got this lace doily to do a great big bowl, but I just haven't gotten it done yet. So this is, at least I get to use it on a plate. If I can't make a big bowl, I can at least make a plate. All right, let's go ahead and just cut this out. Um, I actually want to refer back to that question that I was asked when I was making the first one about the needle tool cutting into the board I'm working on. The needle tool I'm using actually isn't that sharp. It's slightly rounded on the edge because I've used it so much. So if you're going to do this and you're concerned that you might possibly gouge or cut into whatever work board you have, Make sure you use a needle tool that, you know, this is completely rounded over. I'm not going to get hurt at all. It's not sharp, so it's not cutting into my board. All right. These scraps of clay, if you take them right now, dip them in water and put them back in your bag of clay, they'll soften right back up and you can use them immediately. So there's no waste at all there. And put my plastic somewhere. Who, who saw where I did, what I did with that? Nope, don't know. You guys are supposed to be paying attention and tell me where I put my plastic. There it is. <laughs> you are all my assistant. Everybody out there. <laughs> like when I drop a tool and I'm sitting there at the wheel throwing and I can't find it and I'm like, where's my tool? And then I just look up and all of you say, it's under the splash pan. I'm like, yes, thank you. Actually, it's under the, the wheel head because my splash pan on my wheel is one piece. But All right, so just like we did before, we're rubbing those sharp areas so we don't get any cracking or breaking or anything. I'm trying to keep track of time because we got a giveaway. Kev, make sure you give me the warning so I don't run over and we don't give stuff away tonight. Ten minutes. Ten minutes, thanks. Thanks, you're the best. And let's see. So do I use the black side up always? Yeah, for these, because the black side is like a plastic coating. And that question is about this, my rim template. This is actually plastic. This is wood, like a wood product. And if we use the plastic side, the clay will stick to it. And so I like to use the wood side down on the clay. So we'll smooth our edges. 
this looks beautiful as is. I mean, I just love it like this. It could be a trivet. It could, if you let it dry between two boards sandwiched nicely, you could dry it flat and it would make a great little trivet. All right, let's grab another one of these little circle bullet. Oh, you know, do I have my hexagons over here? And I gotta flip it over. I do have my hexagons. What do you guys think? Wanna do some hexes? You do? Okay, we're gonna. So here's a hexagon and we wanna do seashell side. Yes? Yeah. yeah. Seashell side, seashell. <laughs> she sells seashells by the seashore. Don't even ask me to say that. So we have, we have enough space on that one. That would be a good, a good rim. Now you can flip this over onto another board. If you have one board and one board only, you can go ahead and just do what I did there and flip it right onto one. Okay, same thing as that, as that first one we made. We're not gonna use our rib and we're not smearing. We're gonna do a more like a rolling motion, right? That rolling compressing motion down our sides. This is, this is a hexagon, not round, just keep that in mind. And then we're gonna kind of be rolling the clay up towards that side, there's our little point, our little point. And just the act of pressing this into the GR pottery form is enough force. You don't have to crush the clay onto the forms. I see people all the time really like smearing and like, I, I can use no better word than crushing the clay onto the form, you don't need to. It's taking the form really well and you can see this is gonna be pretty. So this side right here, this is really a nice texture. I'm gonna do another one later. I won't have time during this broadcast, but this for the inside, because I love that. I want that on the inside. But we have this really great seashell bowl. That's well, gonna be a plate, but it has to dry, right? So we can't take it out yet, but it would be the same as the ones we did a few minutes ago, where we let it set up four or five hours overnight if you need to. If you have to step away from the studio and you're worried it's gonna to dry too fast, you can leave this on as is and drape this with plastic. I've done that before. If it's really dry, like in the summertime and I'm worried things are gonna dry out too fast on the form, I'll just drape the plates like that one and this one, drape them with plastic. It kind of does look like this in the studio. I'm not even kidding, with plastic all over tables. But you'll come out in the morning and you'll pull it off and you know it's ready because the clay will have risen up off the board a little bit. And then you flip it out and it's good to go. And then weigh it down if you need to. So it almost looks like rockweed on the outside. Oh, Wendy. Yeah, it looks cool, doesn't it? So I'm excited to see this seashell one and I will film taking the form taking it off the form tomorrow. I'll film that and I'll put that up here um, on social media and everything for you guys to see on Facebook and on Instagram. I'll share it for you all. Uh, and you guys can see it there. So you'll have it. So will I mention the 20% off the glazes again before I finish? I sure will. So let's get ready to give away glazes then. So here we go. <laughs> I know, I can't help. I need a rolling cart. That's next, a rolling cart so that I can roll the prize over to show you all. So we are giving away a five pack of the new Mako Stoneware Glazes. Sadly, they're not the great big jars like this. They are the smaller two ounce jars, but you're still getting five of them. That's the new ones I showed at the beginning. And we are running a promo with Clayscapes Pottery. So we've partnered with Clayscapes and Mako for this giveaway and the Mako discount. It's 20% off all Mako stoneware glazes only through Clayscapes Pottery and Mako washes. We're gonna talk about those next week. And you don't need to use a code. They're just doing a blanket 20% off. You just go, the 20% will be applied and it will be good to go. And you just get whatever you want for the Mako glazes. I've used them a lot. You probably see pieces behind me. These are all Mako glazes. So many great Mako combos. If you go onto Clayshare, 
download the ClayShare app, look up Mako. You'll see tons of videos on ways you can use Mako glazes. Now there's other great glazes too, my own, Clayscapes, Amico, Georgie's, but Maggie is for Mako, so we're promoting Mako. All right, so let's give away a sample kit and the way you get entered, it's super easy. You go to ClayShare.com and you sign up for our emails. That's it. Oh, wait, if you're a premium member of ClayShare, guess what? You don't have to do anything, you're automatically entered. And this is open to anybody anywhere in the world because if you're in the US, Mako will ship it to you. If you're outside of the US, Mako is gonna ship it to me and then I will pay to ship it to you. So you don't have to worry about it. You can be in Antarctica, you can win, and I'm gonna send you glazes. You're gonna get your glaze. So wherever you are, you can get some Mako glazes. All right, are we ready to do this? Hey, Kev, do you get a name for me? He's, he's, got the, he's got the card over there. I don't have it here. So I, I have to wait, I have to wait for it. You just got your GR forms too. Awesome, so exciting. So how do you get the set of templates? You can get these rim templates from SharonHoppyDesigns.com. This set here is one I designed. It's called Marigold. And I've got a few other designs and Sharon has a bunch of her own designs as well. So she's the one that makes all of my textured rolling pins, my stamps, and my rim templates. So if you're looking for any of the designs I've done, they will be with Sharon. So you just check her stuff out and you will see she has great stuff and I do too. Okay, are you guys ready? Because I'm ready to give it away. Yay! Hey, hey. Awesome. Did you miss the glazing of the puzzle spheres? You did not. We have those in the bisque right now. So those will be coming out. I'm going to be glazing with Mako Wash next week. Wink, wink. So you might get to see some spheres glazed next week. Next week. Next week. Wink, wink. Right? I am not subtle. Okay. Ready? For the winner of our second of four prizes this month of the five pack of Mako Stoneware Glazes. They're brand new ones. And that winner is... Oh, we don't have the little noise machine with us here. We don't have a drum roll machine. Okay, no, we have to pretend in your head you're a drum roll. The winner is Jane Bradford. Jane Bradford, congratulations, my dear. You have won yourself a five pack of Mako Stoneware Glazes. These right here, which if you missed it, you get the cenote, you get the landslide, you get azurite, you get rainforest, and Himalayan salt. Now, Mako is selling the sample kits. If you want to buy those, you can buy those, or you can get pints, your choice. So congratulations, Jane. We will let Mako know. They will send me your glazes, and then I, well, where is Jane? Is she here? She's in the UK. She's in the UK. So Jane, I'll be sending these to you. Yeah, I think, Ke see, I don't know who wins, but Kevin does because he pulls it and he sees, and I think he was like, yep, it's out of the US tonight. So congratulations, Jane. All right, so next week, we're gonna be doing some glazing with Mako glazes and washes. So we're gonna do that next week. Next in my private broadcast for premium members, we're making wallflowers which is gonna be really fun. I had a new class come out this week all about transporting your pottery, not to be confused with my class that I did a couple years ago on packing and shipping your pottery, two different things, but they're both on ClayShare. ClayShare app as well, because it's the same thing, go download the app. And um, I've got some really awesome classes coming up for the business of pottery, and it's basically um, business plan is coming up next. I know, business plans. We want to talk business plans. If you want to have your own pottery business, you do. All right, everyone, take care. Get out there, make some great pots, and I can't wait to see it. Tag us with Made with Clay Share when you put it up on social media so I can see what y'all are doing, and share it with the world. Bye, everybody.